70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. You don't want to be measured against the average. There's no shortcuts. You know, you walk 10 miles into the woods, you're gonna have to walk 10 miles out. You, you've damaged your body for decades. You've been eating whole foods, fruits, vegetables, and grains, lean meat, limit fat, and all these sorts of things. I drank skim milk for 35 years and and people are getting sick as a result of it people go, oh well people aren't listening people aren't doing what they're told it's like no the problem is they are listening the problem is they are doing what was recommended to them and that is what is getting them sick so we're gonna play a game basically i have 10 foods here for people that want to heal they want the best results from carnivore we're gonna get dr chafee's opinion so are you ready for the first one that's good bacon mm -hmm. bacon is better than any plant you'll ever have Another food that is so joyful for many people is cheese. Sometimes it ruins our results. What's your mm -hmm. thoughts about cheese? Yeah, I think that I think that's one that I just want to say a big thank you because we have hit 60,000 subscribers on this channel and it's because of each and every one of you watching every week and I have some big plans for this channel including meeting Dr. Bright in person. So if you want to get all the updates on this channel, please hit that subscribe button. Okay, let's get into the interview. Dr. Chafee, welcome back. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you. Now, the one thing that we love about you, Dr. Chafee, is that you make the carnival diet very simple. It's just meat, salt, and water. But some people watching right now, they might not be getting the results that they want. So today, Dr. Chafee and I are going to talk about 10 things that I personally see on YouTube and also in my community that might be ruining your results. And we're going to get Dr. Chafee's opinion on these 10 things, as well as play a bit of a game in the middle. So stay tuned. So Dr. Chafee, the first thing that I hear a lot that might be ruining people's results is following carnivore trends. So what are your thoughts about that? So uh, sort of things like, you know, just, just like an egg fast or a sardine fast or, or, or what kind of trends? Yes. So a lot of the times we hear trends like a sardine fast, an egg mm -hmm. fast, uh, whether it be specific macros, all of mm -hmm. these different things to try to get faster results. In your opinion, does that matter as much? No, I, I think if you're, if you're just if you're only eating meat and you're not eating all the other things and you're only drinking water, I think those are the main things that people need to worry about that gives the best results for the most amount of people. And, and, you know, if someone finds that they do really well with eggs, then great, eat eggs. You know, that that's totally fine. Some people don't do as well with eggs. Some people find that they, they do best with red meat. Uh, you know, I've heard a few people say that, you know, just eating a whole bunch of sardines that they actually felt good and, and all that sort of stuff. And that's, that's fine. But really what you should do is eat the meat that tastes good to you, that you enjoy and makes you feel the best and that you can afford. And, and it, other than that, I don't think it, it matters as much, you know, obviously, you know, what the, what the animals being fed does matter that, you know, if you're getting a bunch of soy fed pigs, then that, that can cause a bit of a reaction or chicken or eggs and things like that. Um, but if you're, if you're doing well with bacon and, and you're doing fine with eggs and you feel good with that, then I don't think there's a problem with that. Uh, really. I think it's just the most important thing is just eating proper nutrition, eating meat and animal fats and not eating all the other things. I think that is 99.9% .9 of this. And, uh, and what people get the best results will, and it's just doing that. So do you see a place for any of these trends? So say, for example, when you hear from Dr. Boz, she will talk about the three day sardine fast, and that's for people that want to lower their insulin resistance. Do you think that might be better then just doing plain old carnival, meat, salt, and water. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I would be interested to see why she thought so. I mean, I haven't, I haven't really looked into her exact arguments on that. So she, she might have very, very robust arguments on it. But I, I really can't see anything myself, um, just off the top of my head, having not seen her arguments for that. But you know, you, you've eliminated carbohydrates and sugar and alcohol and lectins and all these other things that affect your insulin, and you know, when you're just eating meat, be it sardines or something else, your your insulin is going to start going back to normal and you're going to start reducing your insulin resistance. And there's other people that don't think the insulin resistance is a real thing. It's more to do uh, with the Randall cycle. And again, you know, you're going to, you're going to fix that by not eating a combination of carbohydrates and uh, fat and protein when you're just down to just eating meat. So whatever the mechanism, whether it's a Randall cycle or insulin resistance, it's still being addressed just by eating uh, meat and animal fats. And so I don't, 
necessarily see why sardines in particular would help reduce your insulin resistance uh, or insulin levels more than just steak. And in fact, you know, I do see my patients all the time. Uh, you know, we check their blood work, check their insulin, their fasting insulin levels, and their HbA1c, and all all of them improve every time by going on a on a carnivore diet, regardless of the of the meat that they eat. Also, just one more question about that: uh, when it comes to ketosis, ketones and glucose, mm-hmm. so sardines is not better than just eating plain, like for example, beef, salt, and water. I wouldn't think so. No, yeah, okay. and in fact, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have as much fat as as a fatty ribeye wood, for instance. So you're getting more protein than fat may not be enough fat. I mean, you need, you need fat, you need protein. They're not just calorie sources and, and they're not, they, they can't be in, you know, independently traded, you know, um, you need fat, you need protein, you need both of these things. That is complete nutrition. People talk about a well-rounded diet, a balanced diet. That's, that's what it actually is. Your balance of the macro and micronutrients that you need. And you get that from eating the fat and the lean meat as well. So you need both. Okay. Well, that goes into the second thing that might be ruining people's results. And the thing I hear about a lot, which is purposely lowering your protein to heal inflammation. I, I, you know, I haven't really come across that before with the inflammation side of things. I mean, I have heard people say that you want to keep your protein intake down under a certain threshold so you don't spike your insulin. Um, which doesn't really happen. You don't really get spikes, you know, it can, it can sort of come up a bit. Um, but when you're eating carbohydrates with protein, which is pretty, it doesn't really exist in nature outside of, you know, breast milk. So when you, when you're seeing sort of that combination, that's not normally something that you'd sort of eat in the wild. So when you're eating carbohydrates as well as protein, you you look at the glycemic index, protein will have a, a bigger effect on insulin and blood sugar at that point. But when you're not eating carbohydrates with it, it actually is a much lower response is a much lower, uh, you know, glycemic number. So at the end of the day, I I don't, I don't really much care because, you know, I I think things is, as, uh, you know, going back to first principles, biologically, what, what are we supposed to eat? We're supposed to eat meat and we're supposed to eat fatty meat but we're supposed to eat meat. And so as long as you're doing that, it doesn't really matter what your body's doing. Is your body going, is your body in ketosis 24 seven, uh, or is it coming out slightly and then going back into it? Like, well, whatever it's doing, it's supposed to be doing that because that's how we're designed. You know, we are designed to eat meat. And so if we slip out of ketosis for a second and then get back into it, then that's totally fine. I have never in my entire life checked my ketones. And uh, I don't, I don't care to, because I, I don't, I don't think it matters. I know I'm in ketosis because I'm not dead. You know, I have blood sugar, so I'm making it. And so, you know, I'm still here. I'm still active. I'm still feeling great. So, you know, whatever's happening, you know, it's, uh, it's supposed to happen. Absolutely. Trust in your body's biochemistry. The other thing that a lot of people hear about is the protein leverage hypothesis. Have you heard about that one? Not by that name anyway. Basically, your body is going to need a certain amount of protein and that if you don't get enough protein, you'll eat enough energy or calories until you get that sufficient amount of protein required for your body. Yeah, well, it goes, it does go the other way. Um, and you have a protein um, starvation, rabbit uh, starvation or protein poisoning sort of things. We're eating such lean meat and you're not, and you're getting that as a majority of your calories. I, you know, and for some people, some, for some reason, people just voraciously eat and they can't eat enough. They just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating. And, and then they die. You know, people have, have died from that historically. And, um, you know, I sort of think of that as, as a, you need those nutrients apart from protein, you need something else coming in your body's just, just ravenously going after it. And, and something I've said before is that your body tracks nutrients. It does not, and, and it chases nutrients. It does not chase calories, but doesn't know what a calorie is. That's a, that's a human invention. And, uh, we have receptors in our stomach that look for, uh, the different macros and micros and it tracks up your brain, uh, tracks up your brain through the vagus nerve and uh, tells your brain, Hey, th- these are the, the nutrients that are coming down the pipe. And this is why you can have food in your stomach and your brain just goes, yep, that's fine. And you just sort of, I'm not really hungry anymore. You haven't absorbed it. It's not in your body. You don't see you know, those sorts of changes yet your body knows ahead of time what's coming down the pipe. And it says, no, no, we, we can stop eating here. And if you're not getting enough, your body keeps eating. And this is, this is why that whole fad diet of just eating a whole bunch of fiber in the eighties 
was not effective for weight loss. People who got you know fatter and sicker and obesity rates just went higher and higher and higher. I think at the time they were around 8%. Now it's 42% obesity. So that didn't work. And it, you know, it just kept going up even in the eighties as they were doing this. And that's because they, they said that, well, you eat a bunch of fiber and it's this mass, but it, because you can't break down fiber and these things that basically no nutrition in them that are no calories, certainly that you can eat them as much as you want. It fills you up and it hits those stretch receptors and releases, releases some leptin and your brain goes, Oh, we're full. We're fine. Everything's fine. And, um, but people weren't fine. They felt miserable. They were always hungry. They were bloated. They didn't feel well. And, uh, and this, this, you know, goes down to eating disorders and, and, uh, avoiding eating and, uh, and then being so desperate to eat something without some actual nutrition in it that they, they binge and then they feel so guilty that they purge. And so that that's where you, you see this sharp incline in these eating disorders as well as in the late seventies and eighties. So that's what was happening. Your, your, your brain knew damn well that there wasn't any nutrition coming down the pipe. It was just, you know, I mean, you could have just eaten a bag of styrofoam for all your stomach knew is just like, well, there's nothing in here that's worthwhile. And so you need to eat something. So people were always really hungry. And so, yeah, I think that if you're not getting enough, again, you need protein, you need enough amino acids, you need enough of the vitamins and, and nutrients that come with those amino acids. And if you're not getting them, your body's going to keep telling you to go get them, which is hunger. Now, before we get to the third thing that might be ruining your carnivore results, I wanted to let you know the August carnivore challenge is now open. Every single week, I bring on new carnivore doctors to help answer your medical questions. Because I know some of you are going through issues like side effects. You want to know how much protein and fat you need to eat. I also have carnivore coaches that come on every week. They have been doing this lifestyle for over 10 years and have lost over 200 pounds. And they're there to help you achieve your weight loss goal. So if you'd like to join the August challenge, there is a link in the description with 20% off just for you. Now, the third thing that people always ask is how much fat? How much fat should we be eating? You know, the one stick of butter, all these different things. How much mm -hmm. fat should we be having, especially people coming to carnivore? They want to heal. They want to lose weight. What's your answer mm -hmm. to that one? I, just as much as your body needs. That's why, or that's how much. And so it's going to be different for everyone. You know, it's difficult to make a, a meal plan for people. I, you know, I talk to people and they say, Hey, look, I, I just, I just need to tell you, know, I'm, I weigh this much. I want to weigh this much and I'm this height. You know, how much should I be eating? What should I be eating? What should my macros be? All this. I can't tell you that, you know, everyone's different. Everyone's uh, bodies are different. Their metabolism is different. Uh, there are different stages of, of fat loss or muscle development. And so you know, you're going to need to eat uh, an individual to an individual amount. Most people do pretty well with around one gram of each one gram protein, one gram fat. And that ends up being 70% calories from fat, 30% from protein, just because it's more, you know, nutrient or, or calorically dense, which is a horrible way of measuring this stuff. It's that's not, a, it's not a real measure because we're not combustion engines. Uh, we're chemical factories and power plants. And so these are all individual organic chemicals that have individual chemical reactions in our body. So I, I think it's terrible to think of things as just calories and, and extremely inaccurate on how it actually affects your body. But if we're just, if we're just talking about grams and, you know, people know calories, so you just sort of talk about it in those terms, but grams wise, you know, equal grams of fat and protein seems to be about where most people are at. Now, there could, you know, now people are going to be different. And I think you just, you just have to uh, adjust for how you feel. So, you know, maybe some people will be a bit more fat. Some people will be a bit less fat, um, but you need enough fat. You need enough protein. It usually shakes out to being roughly equal, some, sometimes differently. I think that it's easier to figure out how much, uh, fat you need because your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. You have a bile and your liver makes bile, like makes it slowly over the day. It uh, just keeps making it sort of continuously. And once you run out of bile, it's very difficult for your body to absorb fat and it can absorb some, but it's, it's low percentages. And so the rest of it just goes out. Right. And so this is why people, when they start a carnivore diet, they, they get, uh, you know, disaster pants as, as Joe Rogan called it. And, um, first of all, I think Joe Rogan's probably still drinking coffee and that's definitely a laxative. And so now you're not clogging the pipes with a bunch of fiber. And so that's going to be much more dramatic at that, uh, of an effect at that point. But 
if you're eating a lot more fat than your body can absorb, it will come out. It will come out in, in liquid form. And so, you know, you know, you know, if you're not doing anything, if you're not having coffee, you're not having artificial sweeteners, you're not on medication that's going to, you know, speed things up, you know, and you're, you're getting loose stools. It could be that you're eating too much fat. You sort of pull that back and things normalize. Well, there you go. Right. Um, but it is very difficult to eat too much fat because you, you just don't absorb it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to eat too much fat to the point that, that your body is just, you know, you know, doesn't want it, it's going to come out. Right. you you can absorb a bit after that, but to get too much, whereas like a lot more is being absorbed than your body wants. I mean, you're going to have to eat so much that you're just going to have to be like copious amounts of diarrhea. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> not, it's not really practical, um, to keep doing that. And so, you know, I, and I, I just do not think that our bodies are, are making a random amount of bile. We, our bodies are, are so exacting in the different things that do, unless you have some sort of illness, but I mean, the, the people that would have some weird issue with making the wrong amount of bile. I mean, I, I think you could, you could probably safely dismiss that. You know, I've never heard of that as a thing, but our bodies are so exacting on, on what, what it does and makes, because these are resources and energy and that your body is putting into this. And if you're just making a random amount and, and, and that's the only way you're going to get fat in a real, in a real way, then it needs to be specific because, you, because your body needs a specific amount of fat. It doesn't want too much, but it doesn't want too little. It needs that, that, uh, nutrition source, right? So your body's going to make a very specific amount of bile because I think it wants a very specific amount of fat. And after that, it just goes away. Um, and, and taste is a big driver. Again, you're, your brain tracks the nutrients that are coming in. And when you're eating, you know, it, it, at first, if you're hungry, it tastes amazing. And then you keep eating and it stops tasting as good. And you eventually get to a point where it's just like, this doesn't, this is just not enjoyable. Well, why is that? It's the same piece of meat cooked at the same time in the same conditions, it's the same chemicals should have the same chemical reaction, but that's not, it's not as simple as that. It's your brain recognizing the nutrients. Now they want them. Now they don't. Right. And so they're going to be expressed differently. And you can get pretty bored of lean meat pretty quickly if you're eating just, you know, ground beef or something like that. It's just like, well, that's boring. You start adding some fat in there or some bacon. Like, Whoop, that nope, that's good. And so, you know, you can you can go by your taste as well and just just eat eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. You know, see, check your your stools. If you're drying hard and constipated, then you know, increase the fat. You definitely are not getting enough fat if that's the case. And if you're getting loose stools, then it's too much. And so you just sort of just see your body, but it's usually that one to one is pretty good. Then there's like the 80, 20 is two to one, uh, fat grams to protein grams. Some people do better on that. Some people do better on a bit less fat. So aim for one to one at first, and then, you know, take a look at what your body actually wants and is asking for and what tastes good to you. And just, just do that. It should be intuitive. Um, just, just don't skip on the fat. Absolutely. You see, Dr. Chafee makes it very simple. When he talks, it's like, oh yes, this is easy. This is doable. And I think that the carnival foods that we're going to talk about with, with our game is going to help people understand this is maybe too lean. This is maybe too fat. This is good. This is not so good. So that's going to help as well. But another food that is so joyful for many people is cheese. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it ruins our results. What's your thoughts mm -hmm. about cheese? Yeah, I think that I think that's one that that a lot of people can stall on if they're trying to lose body fat or even put on body fat. They can put on weight. Again, your body's tracking nutrients, and and cheese and milk and dairy and things like that have a lot of nutrients that we need. They're very good. Some things we don't necessarily want as much of, like casein and the milk proteins, can be pro-inflammatory. And so, you know, especially for people with autoimmune issues, they really need to. Uh, think twice about that because most of them will react negatively to dairy, even A2 dairy. You know, there's A1 and A2 proteins. A, A2 is much less inflammatory than A1, but it's actually still uh, inflammatory. So it's not, it's not perfect anyway. A lot of people will find that they'll eat dairy, but their body still wants the other nutrients that come with meat that aren't in the dairy. So a lot of people will eat pretty much the same amount of meat in a day and the dairy as well. So they'll, they'll eat some dairy and it doesn't actually offset the amount of meat that they eat. And so in, in fact, they'll end up eating, you know, more than, than their body may want. And they're maybe pro-inflammatory and, and all that sort of stuff. So I do see that people do go a little overboard on, on the cheese. Now, if some people don't, don't have a problem with cheese and they don't react poorly to it and you want to melt some cheese on some eggs or 
or meat or something like that, you know, fine. But the problem is, as soon as you say, yes, dairy is okay, but they, they don't hear anything after the, but they just hear, oh, dairy is good. And so they, they're just, just dumping down, you know, gallons of milk, they're eating tons of cheese, you're just chewing on blocks of cheese and eating, you know, tubs of yogurt and things like that. And, uh, you know, talk to people, like, oh, I'm, I'm starting putting on weight. Like what's going on? And you look at what they're eating. I'm like, well, I, I don't have uh, any, any doubt that you would be, you know? And so, yeah, just uh, something that people need to be mindful of. And then so many people, you know, they'll just say, you know, you ask them what they're eating. It's like, oh, well, I'm not, you know, not having the results I want or whatever. And you're like, okay, well, you know, what are you eating? Like, what's going on? And they were like, oh, you know, mostly halloumi. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, and they, you know, they just go to go to Costco and they get like a, you know, a, you know, a six pound tub of halloumi cheese. And they just like, you know, just fry that up every day. And they're just eating just blocks of cheese like all day, every day. And it's just like, okay, that, so that's not what we're doing here. The diet is meat. Meat is the meal. That's where you get your nutrients from. And, and milk, of course, you know, has lactose and it can have enough lactose that it can raise your insulin and, uh, and, uh, that can, that can upset your metabolism in a lot of ways and put you in a fat storage metabolism, as opposed to a fat burning metabolism. So, you know, it's just something, something to remember the meat, the meat is the meal. That's what you want to eat, eat meat, fatty meat, water. You can salt if you want to, you don't have to, uh, most people do just fine without salt. And, and some people swear by the fact that they, they, uh, have taken out salt and they feel much better for that as well. So, um, but meat, water, cheese is a bit of a gray area. I really would avoid milk. Um, you know, raw milk is obviously better than pasteurized milk, but I, I certainly wouldn't do it every day. I would, I would just keep that as like a, a rare special occasion and just, just eat meat and be happy and get on with your life. Now, the other thing that is, gives people so much joy along with the cheese is some alcohol. I'm keen to hear your thoughts because I don't think that many people following the carnival lifestyle drink every day. You know, it's probably infrequent, but in your opinion, even infrequent amounts of alcohol, is that going to affect people's results? Well, I mean, yeah, of course it will. And, and it depends on what people define as infrequent. You know, it is, it is poison and it's, you know, it's a serious one and it will upset your metabolism in a lot of ways and it will kick on different genes and, and uh, set off inflammatory pathways that, that actually take a f about three weeks to really start clearing up. And it's not that you're hung over for three weeks or anything like that. It's just that you don't feel your best. You don't have the same energy and it's just something's like, hmm, something's just a bit off. And, uh, and that's what it is. And so I've noticed that in myself, I've noticed that in others. And, uh, and it's about three weeks until you start getting back to feeling like a superhero again, which is the whole point. Some people do drink on carnivore. They generally do it very rarely and, uh, they try to keep it to, you know, like spirits, like hard alcohol, you know, like just, just clear vodka and things like that. No mixers, you know, putting with like, you know, club, so you know, soda water or something like that, you know, and that seems to be, you know, better, but you'll still have three weeks that you're, that you're recovering from that until you feel, you know, like your old self. And so people generally just naturally will drink less and less and less. And just because they don't want to feel bad, they want to feel good all the time. Alcohol is a big one for people falling off because, you know, they think it's all or nothing. If they, if they ever want to have something outside of carnivore, that means that they just, they're not able to do it at all. And they're just going to go back to eating pizza and donuts. And of course that's not the case. You know, if you, if you, if it's a special occasion and you want to drink some time, or even if you, you want to drink regularly, it's still better to, you know, drink like the hard alcohol, things like that, with all the mixers and the sugars and the beers and the wines and things like that. that have all the other nasty stuff in them and not eat all the other garbage that goes along with that than to drink and drink all that stuff and eat all the garbage as well, right? It's always better to eat less poison, right? It, it's, you know, if you're going to have some uh, drinks every now and then, uh, that doesn't mean that you have to go back and eat that way. And it doesn't mean that you have to go back to drinking multiple times a week or even once a week. So, you know, it's, um, but it is something I'll have friends that have been on carnivore for like eight months and like, wow, I've never felt better. Everything's great. And like, yeah, but you know, I went out and I really want to go, you know, had a buddy in town and we went out drinking and stuff like that. So I was just like, oh yeah, I guess it's just not for me. It's like, no, you can do that. You know, you can have that time, but you know, just don't try not to make it as too often. It's going to affect you for three weeks. You know, it's, it's going to knock you back for three weeks. So, you know, just make it worth three weeks of your life. You know, not many things meet that criteria for me. And so I happily just don't drink. I was, you know, I was fortunate that, you know, I chose to stop drinking 
during the rugby season when I was uh, 21, like after my 21st birthday, I got pneumonia and, you know, I was just like, I couldn't drink about a month. And I, you know, I went out, you know, to bars after the rugby games. And I just felt so self-conscious, you know, it's just, just so weird that I wasn't, I was the only one not drinking. Um, you know, after a couple of times doing that, I just, I just didn't care. And then I actually preferred it. And I was playing so much better and feeling so much better that I was just like, wow, I'm just not going to drink the rest of the season. See how it goes. Had the best season of my life. And then the next season I was like, okay, I'm going to do it because I was like halfway through the season. So I was like, all right, well, I'll do this for the whole season next time. And I, again, had like the best season of my life. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to drink during the rugby season. So I'm already used to that. I'm already happy to not drink. I have no problem going out and being in social uh, gatherings and and going to bars and and going to dinners and things like that where everyone else is drinking and I'm not drinking. I don't, it doesn't matter. And people really don't care. You know, some people might say, oh, why aren't you having a drink? Oh, why don't you have a drink with me? You know, it's, it's nice. It's a social sort of bonding thing that people get used to doing. But after that, it's like, oh, no, I, I really don't drink, you know, and you're just drinking water. Like They just they stop caring so quickly. Like It's just not a big deal. Um, there are studies that actually show that people's inhibitions to eating crappy food and sh- especially like, you know, sugars and carbs and things like that. Uh, actually, it goes down uh, when you when you drink alcohol. So people are much more likely to eat that sort of you know, ultra processed garbage food, sugars and carbs. Um, at, you know, when drinking or in, and actually uh, up to a few days after you uh, a night out drinking. So it's just, just to, to understand that, that you can start getting carb cravings again. You can start getting sugar cravings again. These things hit very similar pathways in our, in our brain and our bodies, especially alcohol and fructose. And so, you know, you can find that, you know, you're, you're dealing with those sorts of things. So if you, if you want to drink, I just would keep it very rare, if at all, and, um, you know, trying to keep it to spirits and just be mindful. Hey, this is a one-off and you, you know, you don't let it, you know, take you completely off the wagon and, uh, and, and get you away from, from doing what you know is healthy. I mean, that, that's the main thing, you know, you want to, you want to do something here and there, like that's fine, but you shouldn't do something that's going to tear you away completely. Right. Because then, then you're really not going to be, uh, healthy. If you can do something and then come right back to it and get your health back in order. You know, that's obviously a lot better than doing that and then keeping doing it and keeping doing it. And then you're, you're back at square one. Absolutely. It's important to try to stay consistent, do as much as you can, the best that you can most of the time. And that goes into eating the best kind of foods most of the time. So we're going to play a game and it's called mm-hmm. Carnival Food Roulette. Basically, I have 10 foods here. They are carnival, but some are going to be better than others. So for people that want to heal, they want the best results from carnival, we're going to get Dr. Chafee's opinion on these foods so that you can think, okay, best, good, not so good, and make your own decision. So are you ready for the first one? Sounds good. Chicken breast. Oh, it's okay. It's not great. It's very lean. Uh, I've had the skin on it, you know, a little better. But, you know, it's just, it's mostly protein. There's really not much fat, which is why it doesn't taste that interesting, which is why most people don't like the chicken breast because fat is flavor. And so you're only getting the protein. Uh, that's interesting for a short period of time. And then your, your brain's like, nope, we want, we want fat. So we want other nutrients as well. Uh, also something I learned recently was that the, uh, chicken manufacturers and, and the tasters and things like that, they actually go for bland on chicken. They don't want like actual like chickeny flavor. Chicken flavor used to be a, a major flavoring and you know chips and crackers and all these sorts of things. Now chicken doesn't taste like anything. Now you have, you know, all the different, you know, uh, uh you know, teriyaki chicken, you know, peanut chicken, all these sorts of different things that, that you add flavors to. So it's a, it's like a sort of a vehicle like tofu where you you add something to it that t- and and the and the chicken takes on that flavor. Um if you are if you are feeding a chicken what it's normally supposed to eat, and it's a little older, it, it has a much stronger taste. And uh, for some reason, the idiots in charge decided that bland is better. So they, they wanted basically tasteless, useless chicken. And if it's tasteless, it doesn't have all that flavor. I mean, that, that's nutrients that you're tasting. And so those good tastes, like, hey, that tastes good. Your brain's saying, hey, there's nutrients in there that we want. Obviously, sugar is an outlier. That's just a drug. So, of course, you're, you're going to say, oh, I want more of that. You're going to say you want more of cocaine as well. So that's not the same thing. But, you know, your brain also looks for nutrients, right? And so, you know, you get that positive feedback when you're when you're getting these nutrients. And it's just this bland sort of nothing flavor, which is what chicken breast is, is just, it's just telling you that it's not 
too nutritious. It doesn't have everything that you may want. And I'm sure that if it's not chicken breast, is drumsticks and thigh a better option or the whole chicken with the hmm. skin? Uh, well, yeah, certainly everything with the skin. Um, but uh, the chicken breast and the, uh, the or the thigh and the drumstick, absolutely. Yeah, the, the dark meat's much better, has a better fat content, better nutrient content, and, and certainly with the skin on as well. That's why the skin's the most tasty part of the chicken is because it has more nutrients in it. And so, yeah, so yeah, definitely if, when, when I talk to people, you know, for, uh, you know, their own preferences or affordability, you know, they sometimes, you know, want to do chicken. I just say, fine, just do chicken drumsticks or thighs with the skin on and, and avoid, you know, the skinless options and the breasts. Yeah. Perfect. And then this one has a lot of nutrients. Keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. So, uh, ribeye in the States is about that one-to-one -one, uh, grams of fat and protein. So it's about 70% calories from fat in other countries, like in Australia, it's, it's not really a ribeye. It's called a Scotch fillet where they actually trim off all the fat around the outside. And, uh, it's much, much leaner and they actually breed the cows here to be much leaner as well, because that's just, that's just the market here, unfortunately. But, you know, generally that's, that's a very good uh, mix that's going to, that's, you know, red meat in general seems to be much more nutritious. The ruminant animals are better able to break down and detoxify different plant chemicals, you know, even, even the ones that they don't typically eat or weren't designed to eat, like, you know, cows and grasses. So they're being fed, you know, corn and grain and things like that. You know, that's going to be things that they're not really used to eating, but they're better able at detoxifying and breaking that stuff down. So whereas like a pig or a chicken, they're monogastrics, they, they're not as able to do that. Uh, it seems that they don't detoxify and eliminate these, these poisons and toxins as much as, uh, other animals do. And so that sort of gets through into the meat and, and you'll, you'll look at like the fat content, you know, when they're fed all these, you know, soy and grain and things like that, you know, the, the oils from those, those plants actually end up in, in the pig and the chicken. So they have high levels of linoleic acid, which is, you know, plant oils, um, you know, most plant oils are like 80% linoleic acid. This stuff is toxic, toxic, toxic stuff. There's actually a randomized control trial where they used um, polyunsaturated fats like linoleic acid and replaced saturated fats with them, which is which is like literally on you know most medical board examination questions. Like, well, how would you do this? How do you lower? It? What should you do? Oh, you should. You should lower it with polyunsaturated fats. You should replace saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats. There's a randomized control trial that actually showed that, you know, when doing that, you know, with these things there, you know, a lot of them have a, have a high portion of linoleic acid. Uh, it did indeed lower people's LDL cholesterol. And in fact, in that group that started eating more unsaturated fats and lowered their LDL cholesterol, they started having more heart attacks and strokes and dying more. So that's not good. You know, because the whole point here is is to uh, reduce death, reduce disease, not to reduce cholesterol. Like, you know, the point of reducing cholesterol is because we're told that higher cholesterol equals higher heart attacks and strokes. That is not the case. That is flat out lie. And uh, we have plenty of studies showing exactly that. And that's something we're going to talk about a bit later. But speaking of products from a pig that might be mm -hmm. toxic, key to hear your thought about this one, bacon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so again, you know, it, it, if you're eating if you're eating meat, that's better than any other option, right? So bacon is better than any plant you'll ever have, right? Um, even if it's you know not not raised in the best ways, but it's still giving you very healthy things, it's still giving you healthy fats, healthy proteins, healthy nutrients that you need, and it's eliminating out most of the things that you don't want in those soy and corn fed cows. A lot of these things are coming from China and they're just dumping in soy. Uh, and so they're, they're not as healthy. And so they have, have a lot of linoleic acid and things like that. And then some bacon, you know, if you're going to have bacon, I think it's, I think it's better if you can to get the, you know, sugar-free bacon, the ones that don't use sugar in the cure, yeah, but even the ones that, that do use, you know, some sugar, it's, it's a very small amount. It's like less than, you know, one gram per serving. So you know, one gram per few pieces of bacon or something like that. And um, so you can get cleaner ones or you can get ones that are maple bacon. They had a lot of sugar. So definitely avoid those. So you get, get ones that aren't as, as processed, aren't as, don't have as much sugar added. Um, but either way, you know, that bacon is going to be better than any other plant 
that that you ever choose to eat. So if that's what you have available to you, um, you know, then go for it. If you can get it from, you know, pasture raised pigs that aren't fed corn and soy, even better. Okay. Well, the next carnival superfood, we're hearing that Mm -hmm. sardines is a superfood. What's your take if you eat a lot of sardines or just more sardines in your carnival diet? It's probably fine. You know, good omega-3s, things like that. I mean, calling them a a superfood, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think all meat is a superfood. I think all meat is is the only superfood. I think the only thing that is a superfood for any species is what that species evolved to eat and what is biologically appropriate for that animal, right? And so grass is a superfood for cows. Gazelle is a superfood for lions and meat is a superfood for us. So any meat, any meat is fine. Um, you know, sardines are a bit lean, you know, the s- smaller fishes are, are a bit lean, but you know, they, they do have good fat, very good uh, fatty acids like the omega threes. And, and those are, those are great for you. So ha- having a bit of sardines every now and then, uh, as an addition to your, to your steaks or whatever else you're eating, I think is, is a great idea. Okay. Well, talking about the seafood category, salmon. Yes. Yeah. Good. Salmon is good too. Yeah. And it's good. It's a good fatty fish. So salmon, it has about 60% calories from fat. And so it's, um, you know, it's up there. So maybe if people need a bit more fat than that, then they just, you know, melt some butter on it or something like that, which is just going to make it taste better anyway. Um, but it's good. So some people worry about seafood, especially, you know, up the food chain in, in the seafood, because you're going to get uh, higher concentrations of heavy metals like mercury. That's not something I, you know, and that's certainly something that, you know, people you know should, should be interested in and at least look into. I don't eat too much seafood myself. It's just every now and then I'll sort of see some, a piece of salmon or something like that at Costco. I'm like, Oh, that looks good. I think I'll grab that. That's about, that's about it for me. Um, I haven't really looked, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of fear mongering with, with meat in general. And so, you know, I have my suspicions when anybody says like, oh, you got to avoid this meat or that meat because of all this toxin and this and that. Maybe, maybe there's, there's mercury, but you know, I'm, I'm sure there is, you know, but you know, what, what is that level? And, and is that, is that as harmful as they're saying it is? I don't know. It, I mean, it's something that you should think about. I mean, you shouldn't just dismiss it. Um, but you know, the Japanese eat a lot of seafood and um, they don't seem to be dropping dead of mercury poisoning or having, you know, very severe and serious uh, health ramifications as a result of that. There were issues back in, I think the fifties and sixties, where they're having some weird illnesses and diseases running through and they didn't know why people were getting sick and people were dying. You know, after about 10 years of investigating, they finally decided, well, they found some little isolated bacteria or something like that. And they're like, okay, it must be this, this little pathogen and we'll try and fix it. And they spent another decade trying to cure this pathogen. And then after 20 years, of basically chasing their tails, they figured out like, oh, actually, this is this is coming from all the pollution coming out of our of our factories into the ocean, and that's getting into the food supply, and we're eating a bunch of fish, and people are getting poisoned from that. So that that is not a a, a non issue. It's not something that you know I think is is too much of a concern if you're just having some salmon every now and then. There are a lot of very beneficial things in salmon. If you're eating salmon every single day, yeah, maybe look in to where your salmon is coming from and what the the you know, the heavy metal content is on that. And then just, you know, choose, decide accordingly, but you know, having some salmon every now and then is, is perfectly fine. Okay. We know you love your ribeyes. What about ground beef? Ground beef is great. Ground beef is just as good as ribeye as long as it has enough fat. So it's still from the same animal, right? So it's still beef it still should be just as nutritious. In fact, sometimes you can get even better ground beef than you can get other, other sorts of um, cuts because, People, for some damn silly reason, they think that older cows, um, they're too tough. So you can't, you can't like butcher them and, and turn them into steaks and sell those, um, which is completely wrong. That's, I've, I've, I've had a 10 year old cow. It was perfect. It was beautiful. The gristle was like whalebone. Like, I don't know what happened to that stuff, but it was like, it, that was rock hard. Um, like the tendons and things like that. But, you know, the meat itself was was perfectly soft. The fat was perfectly soft. It was just like the connective tissue, the tendons and things like that. Like that's that was tougher, but it was easier to pick out. And then you just don't have to like chew on it for an hour. You know, you just pull it out and then you don't eat that. As a result, they end up just grinding the whole cow down into hamburger and either just keeping it or, or putting it or selling it out as hamburger. And so, you know, if you get one of these like, you know, 10 year old, five year old, 15 year old cows that have been ground up in a hamburger that could be the best damn meat that you've ever eaten and so you know it's luck of the draw so no yeah no ground beef is great so just beef in general 
is fantastic. I would, I would sort of rank that right there up at the top um, of, uh, of nutritious meats and whether it's ground or in a steak. I thought that yeah. you would love that. Now the next one, yeah. Dr. Bright absolutely loves, has a lot of it. And what are your thoughts mm-hmm. on butter? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, butter's good. There's a lot of healthy fats and a lot of healthy nutrients and uh, and uh, fat soluble vitamins, which are great. Some people have a bit of a problem with dairy, and they might have a problem with the milk proteins in the butter. Uh, ghee is a good workaround for that. It also has a higher smoke point if you want to cook with it. But I, you know, I don't have a problem with butter. I don't I don't react poorly to dairy, and so I you know that's my workaround for the fact that they they trim off way too much fat. From the steaks here in Australia, if I'm if I'm getting ribeye, I'll, I'll melt butter onto the top of it. Tastes amazing, and uh, and I increase the amount of fat that I have. So yeah, no, that's fine as long as as yeah. So butter's great as long as you, uh, you know, do well with it. You know, if you react poorly to it, then yeah, you know, find something else like butter or lard or something like that. Well, the next one is something that I know that you'd like, but if somebody has a weight loss goal, if somebody mm-hmm. wants to heal inflammation, is raw milk okay well you know i guess it i guess it depends you know it's compared to what like if they're if they're coming from you know eating a high pro, ultra processed diet or a vegan diet or or these other sorts of very pro-inflammatory diets that are lacking in nutrient nutrition then you know raw milk is, is going to be a big step up and you're going to improve greatly from that i don't think it's the best thing that you can do um you know weston a price actually found that in a lot of these uh, places that were just eating a whole bunch of you know plants and things like that are very nutrient starved had a lot of you know, uh, growth abnormalities and and nutritional deficiencies, and he found that that raw milk was one of one of the quickest ways of getting people healthy again. You know, and it, and it will. It has a lot of really good nutrients in it, but uh, it's not as good as a steak. You know, and it doesn't have it doesn't have all the things that that you want exactly. Um, and it and it can be pro inflammatory, and especially people with autoimmune issues. Um, they're ju- you're just going to. Uh, uh, react more strongly to milk proteins. And, uh, and then also if you're drinking enough of it, now kids that are, that are nursing on breast milk, they're, they're in ketosis. And this is when their brains are, are growing the fastest. Yeah. So even though there's lactose, they're actually still in ketosis. And so as an adult, that doesn't necessarily work like that. And so we, we can, we can raise our insulin, we can reduce our ketones and ketones directly reduce inflammation as well. Right. And so you really want to avoid carbohydrates or anything that can suppress your ketone production, like lectins. So, you know, people on a, on a ketogenic diet, you know, they can actually eat different lectins that, you know, don't come with carbs, but they actually bind to the insulin receptors more tightly than insulin sometimes. And so you can still get this suppressive effect. And so if you do anything that, that's going to suppress your ketones, it can also produce inflammation, but it also suppresses these ketones and other things that are going to reduce inflammation as well. And so, you know, that, that could be a thing. So I'm sure it's going to be a lot better than what you were doing before, but if you're going for optimal, if you're going for the best possible outcome, then probably want to avoid that for most people. Well, some people will do just fine on it, but I think, uh, you know, most people, if you're really trying to maximize that, especially if you have inflammatory problems, like autoimmune issues, if you're you're going to do better without any milk and just red meat and water, really probably as much grass finished red meat and water as you can get. Okay. Second last one is fruit. Now this is not just all fruit. I'm more talking about low sugar fruit, like berries and that kind of thing. Is that okay to have from time to time? If you want, you know, I mean, yeah, you can have some alcohol from time to time if you want to, or some cocaine or whatever. It's, it's totally up to you. It's, it's up to the individual. I don't think it's optimal. I know you don't need it, you know? And so if you want it as a treat, you know, understand it is a treat and it's not the best thing you could do for your body. You know, depending on the berry, they can, first of all, most berries will kill you, you know, uh, like if you just like go out in the woods and there's just random berries on a bush, don't eat them. You know, like most of them will kill you. And that's because they've evolved with birds and the plant wants a bird to eat it or a specific bird to eat it. So they'll, those seeds will germinate in their gut and then be passed around distantly. They don't just want any random animal to eat those berries. They want specific animals to eat those berries. And usually it's birds. So there are some that we can eat. And it's usually the sweeter ones that are less toxic. That's what the thought is on fructose and why that's that's the sweetest of the carbohydrates is because that we we've, we've come to recognize that as safe because we we don't really know of any plants that are acutely poisonous that will like kill you that day. 
uh, that have fructose. And so we've recognized that or, or our ancestors who have found that more desirable and say, Hey, well, this kind of tastes a bit good. This tastes sort of good. Um, those are the ones that were able to sort of recognize safer foods and, and survive a famine better. Right. And so those are the ones that survived. There's a survival advantage, uh, but long-term, you know, fructose is really bad for you. And so, you know, I don't think that's, that's really what you want to do, but in general, things with fructose tend to be less toxic. Now that comes with a few caveats. They aren't completely devoid of toxins, you know, like blueberries will have a lot of tannins and oxalates, right? All citrus have different furanocoumarins, which are UV sensitive and will bind to uh, proteins and DNA and damage them permanently in the, in the presence of UV light. So if it gets on your skin, you can get chemical burns. Um, and this is, this is well known, established and documented in dermatology and it's in textbooks and all the rest. And it happens to real people and real, and you know, you know, adults and children. And then if you're eating this stuff too, those furanocoumarins are, are, toxic chemicals, your body has to detoxify them. They're causing problems. You can get light sensitivity, um, you know, as well from ingesting them. Um, so they're not, they're not completely devoid of harm. They're not completely benign just because they, they have a bit of sugar in them. And then, you know, sugar long-term fructose long-term is a drug and it's harmful and it damages your body in the same way as alcohol does because fructose is broken down into the same byproducts as alcohol in your liver. So you get the same problems like fatty liver disease, cirrhosis, diabetes, heart disease, even implicated in cancer and Alzheimer's, right? So that's not, that's not what you want. I just don't think there's any need anyway. You know, I'm not eating for entertainment. I'm not eating to, you know, uh, interest myself. You know, my, I have enough stuff going on in my life that I'm not, you know, just needing entertainment for my food. I'm not that bored. And so, <laughs> you know, I can, I can go and do some, some other things, but you know, if, if people want some berries every now and then, you know, that's your business. The other caveat is that these things absolutely still have toxins in them. And the reason they have toxins in them is because this a it's protecting the seed. So it only wants certain things to eat, eat that plant uh, or eat that fruit, but also when they're not ripe, the seed's not ready. And it absolutely does not want anything to eat that it wants it to be ripe. And that's when it's easy. It's softer. It falls off the the stem really easily, right? So it's, it's all it's all there, geared up, ready to go. Plants say, yep, 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 you can take it now. Uh, before then, when it's hard and it's more tart and it doesn't have all the sweetness or whatever, it's, um, it's going to be a lot more toxic. And this is why people thought for centuries that green tomatoes were poisonous. You can't eat green tomatoes, they're poisonous, right? And then, you know, in my lifetime, I remember, oh, well, that's just an old wives' tale, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that's not that's not an old wives' tale. It has a lot more solanine, it has a lot more defense chemicals in it when it's green because it doesn't want anything messing with its seeds uh, before they're ready to go. When they vine ripen, I mean, they even smell different. Like if you get tomatoes at the store, you know, there's just not much smell. It's not very interesting on a, on a, on a, you know, box ripened one, you get the, you know, fresh vine ripened, like something fresh and like nice. Like, Oh, actually that's, that's a nice smell. And, uh, and then, you know, normally traditionally people would put them in boiling water, take the skin off and then take the seeds out and only use the pulp. And that's so again, taking out the more toxic parts of that fruit, more toxic, it doesn't get rid of all of them. And there are studies that show that if you take, if you pick uh, tomatoes green, that they don't actually get rid of the toxins. So we're picking all this fruit when it's green, when it's super toxic, right? Or at least more toxic. And then it does not necessarily get rid of all those toxins when they get to you. So if you have a blueberry bush and you're picking these things dead ripe, that's gonna be a lot better. Or if you have an avocado tree and you're picking that avocado as it's just falling off in your hands, that's gonna be a lot better. doesn't mean that it doesn't have oxalates that it doesn't have tannins, that it doesn't have all these other things. But avocados, when they're green, have four times the amount of oxalates in them than when they're ripe, right? So it, it does make a difference on that as well. And if you're buying it from the store, you can guarantee that unless it says vine ripened, tree ripened, whatever, it is not. It is definitely not. Good thing I don't buy tomatoes or any other vegetable because yeah, can't exactly. trust it. Exactly, right? It's scary. And and it's it's so much easier when you just don't buy the crap in the first place. You know, just like that that's someone else's problem, which is great. The next one, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Now, fatty latte is coffee <laughs> with butter in it. We know your thoughts mm. about coffee. So what do you think about fatty um, latte? Well, I mean, the butter is fine. You know, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't drink the, the latte part of it. So, you know, there, there are some people that, that do that as a work or have a workaround on that, which is called uh, bulletproof water, sort of warm water, hot water, 
put a stick of butter into it and just blended that up like you would like like bulletproof coffee, right? And then just whips it up. It's all creamy and foamy. It's actually like frothy. It's really nice actually. And um, and you can sort of drink that. So it's like this hot buttery drink and uh, and you don't have to have the coffee with it as well. So if I were to do something like that, it would be that. I, I really, I just, I don't know. I just eat meat. I just, I had to ask you because, you know, it's yeah. fatty latte. Yeah. Everyone loves it. Had to ask Dr. Chafee. So that is the yeah. game out of the way. We're going to get to the next five things that might be ruining your results. Now, the one that I always hear about is cholesterol. Worrying about cholesterol. Can you share more of your thoughts around if somebody's having a conversation about cholesterol with their doctor, how should they navigate that conversation? Well, yeah, it's interesting, you know, because the more and more doctors are understanding that that this was a just complete con, uh, that that LDL and cholesterol was a problem in the first place. I really don't waste my time checking cholesterol unless it's to, you know, you know, get someone a baseline or they're interested and they, and they want to see how it progresses and you can show them that their, their LDL may go up, it may go down, um, may stay the same sort of, there's a lot of independent variables there, but HDL is going to go up, triglycerides are going to go down. And that's just a marker of a uh, reduction of inflammation and oxidative stress and glycation in your body. But that that's better checked by checking your HbA1c and your you know fasting insulin and all these other sorts of things and, and different markers that will give you the same answer but but better, you know. Uh, I really just don't I don't think it's a useful test to look for cholesterol because it's it, again it's highly variable and uh, it was never a problem. It was never a problem in the first place. And in fact, there are a lot of studies now, large studies, hundreds of thousands of people that actually show that people that have higher LDL cholesterol live longer. So the only thing that that LDL cholesterol is actually associated with is longevity. And so, you know, you might want to check your cholesterol and say, hey, your LDL is high. Good job. You know, <laughs> and, um, and your HCL is high too. And your triglycerides are, are down and trending down. And, uh, and that's it. It's, but it's academic. You know, and that's going to happen. You know, I guess, I guess you could be someone who had, was in a weird situation and maybe your HDL wasn't really improving. Your triglycerides were sort of creeping up and it's just like, okay, well maybe, you know, what the hell are you eating exactly? And maybe that, that'll sort of, you know, tell you that, that something's not, not agreeing with you or the things that you're eating are, 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 are not ideal. And we need to change those things up. Maybe you're eating a bunch of, you know, keto treats and snacks and all these sort of different weird things that aren't just meat and water. But again, I just don't think that's it's a very good metric to look at. So unfortunately, not not everyone is aware of that yet. Not everyone has sort of kept up on that research. And so uh, you know you might you, you well, the odds are that your doctor won't know that. but there are more. There are more and more and more, I don't know, probably about a third of of doctors I speak to now are just like, oh yeah, no, that that that's complete crap. Um, and so you know it's getting it's getting out there. You know, and more and more people are understanding this. Um, but you know, if you're if you're talking to them, I mean, a you don't have to check your cholesterol. First of all, second of all, you know, if you do, and that's not to say that it's it's completely useless in all circumstances. That's not that's not true. But I think for the vast majority of people on a carnivore diet, uh, it doesn't it doesn't give much utility past what say an HbA one C is going to give you you know, and seeing what your, and your high sensitivity, you know, CRP and things like that. You know, I think that those are, those are probably going to be better markers of, uh, certainly of cardiovascular disease. And so, you know, you can talk to your doctor and just be like, you know, look, you know, this, this is what I'm worried about. You're my doctor. And, and that's the thing. They work for you, right? They are not the boss. They don't get to dictate what happens. You know, they're there to give you advice, you know, and, uh, and you, and you get to decide what you do with that, but it is your choice. You, it's always about informed consent. You know, this is not this does not get to be done to you unless you're in a coma and they have to make an emergency decision, right? And so, you know, you're just saying like, okay, I understand, I understand your concerns with that, but you know, I've seen the research and I've seen you know the literature and I've seen you know different doctors that that have a very different opinion on that, and you know it's not it's really not something I'm I'm concerned about. So I mean, I appreciate your concern. I I, I don't want to take that drug, you know, for one reason or another, and um, you know, but I you know very happy to hear your thoughts on all these other things. But that's just yeah, it's not really something I'm concerned about. You know, the same thing happens when people are smoking or drink too much. And doctor says, Ooh, you really need to cut down smoking. Yeah, I know, doc, but yeah, I'm just not gonna, you know, ah, it's just this is what I do. It's what I want to do. And and they just go, Yeah, okay. 
you know, that's your choice. And then someone says, you know, I've actually looked at the literature and the research and, you know, there's all these like major studies out and, uh, and other doctors and leading cardiologists that are all saying that, yeah, you know, cholesterol is not really a concern. Like, oh, well, yeah, I'm just, I'm not going to be your doctor then if you're not going to listen to me and like, okay, spaz, you know, like you're okay with someone smoking in defiance of you, admitting that it's wrong, admitting that this is bad for them. And they just say, yeah, whatever, I'm going to do what I want. And then they just say, hey, I've made, I made an educated, learned decision uh, that disagrees with your with yours. Um, and, and that's just that's just a, a bridge too far. Like, OK, well, hopefully they aren't as obtuse as that. But, you know, if they are, you know, you are still the boss and you still get to say uh, what goes, what doesn't. The problem is, you know, sometimes with with jobs and things like that, you know, you have to have a cholesterol under a this or a that or whatever, or else you have problems with insurance. That's, you know, that's tough. You know, that's a, that's an individual cir circumstance. But if you're if you're uh, just dealing with just your your one to one personal doctor, then then I would just I would just always remember that you're in charge and that they work for you, and um, you can fire them. You know, you can go to a different doctor, like unless you're in in a, in a, in a uh, healthcare system that doesn't allow you to do that, but most do even in the, in the public, uh, public, uh, healthcare systems and certainly in the private healthcare systems that you can, you can absolutely, uh, fire your doctor and get a new one. Good advice. Fire the doctor, get the new one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, another thing that people, um, perhaps should be testing instead of thinking about cholesterol, thinking about thyroid function, Dr. Bright talks a lot about that. People are hypothyroid. Do you agree with that? Is that what you see a lot for, for people to have metabolic dysregulation? The, the people in general or people on a carnivore diet? People in general. And then when they go on carnivore, what they actually present is problems with their thyroid. It's not eating the meat. It's not eating everything that you're eating. It's to do with an yeah. underlying condition. Well, I, I, I certainly do see a lot of thyroid issues in people and, and thyroid dysfunction and hypothyroidism is, is extremely underdiagnosed. Because, you know, we're looking for, we're looking for big swings. Like you are just so massively suppressed in your thyroid that it's causing huge problems and, or massively raised that it's causing other huge problems, right? Um, there's no nuance, you know, there's no, there's no sort of gray area. It's not someone who is, is, is starting to present and getting worse and worse thyroid issues. And, and the, the problem there is, is really reference ranges. So people will look at reference ranges. They don't actually, they don't actually look up and, and understand and document what the reference ranges for, for optimal health are, right? Well, someone in, you know, a man or a woman in, in their mid twenties who has no medical conditions, you know, what does their thyroid look like? What is their hormones and testosterone and estrogen and B12 and, and vitamin A and things like that? You know, what are those? Those are very different than the reference ranges that we that we see at the lab because the lab reference ranges they will they will differ from every single lab and this was this was not something that was impressed upon us it was something i sort of heard peripherally they were like oh yeah lab tests you know differ between each each lab i was when we were like well why why the hell would that be because you know the reference range is supposed to be like this is the good health range right and they're like oh well you know different people go into different labs and i was like well, that, what the hell does that matter you know and it was it's just like oh well you know it's just an average you just take an average of the people going in there, right? So the first 2,000 people or so that come into a lab that year, that is the reference range, right? But most people getting blood tests are not healthy. They're usually getting blood tests because there's something wrong and their doctors are trying to investigate something. And they could be young, they could be old, they could be fat, they could be sick, they could be all these sorts of things. And odds are they are a lot of those, right? You know, 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. Most countries are similar. 90% uh, of Americans have at least one metabolic issue. Most countries are similar. So you don't want to be measured against the average, right? And so the average reference range for B12, actually half of that reference range is in a known deficiency. So, you know, that that's, you know, people in that reference range in the lower half of that reference range in America, Europe, and, and Australia, they're like, oh yeah, I know you're in the, well within the reference range, right? Well, actually that's already a deficiency. And there, there are uh, studies showing you can get demyelination and nerve damage when it's below that certain zone in Australia is 400, right? But the reference range is 160 to uh, 650 or so, right? But below 400, you can get demyelination and nerve damage, right? And that's, that's. Uh, indicative of that reference range just gradually going down, 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 down because people are getting uh, more and more nutritionally deficient, right? And so the same thing goes with with uh, thyroid. 
right? And so you have your thyroid function and it, it can you know, reference range is, you know, TSH can go up to, you know, 4.5 or something like that. Anything above two doubles your risk of thyroid cancer. So that's not a good range. You know, that's not a range that you want to be in, uh, but that's the range that we see in, in the community, right? So of course, things are going to get less and less uh, underdiagnosed. The more sick people get, the more nutritionally deficient they get, the more thyroid issues that they get, the more hormonal issues that they get, the worse those uh, reference ranges are going to slip down and the less people are going to be diagnosed. And so you have people that fall well within these reference ranges and they feel miserable and they don't feel good. And they're saying, Hey, I don't, I don't feel good. You know, I thought something's wrong. Like, well, I mean, everything's normal, you know, it's like, no, it damn well isn't. And so un unfortunately doctors don't really know that. Uh, most doctors don't. I absolutely see a ton of people that have, you know, you know, on you know, borderline thyroid issues. Uh, I do see them improve on a carnivore diet. Uh, it can take months. You know, a lot of people have Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune issue, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so, and, and, you know, we die, you know, at the, at the you know, medical center I'm at, you know, because we use more accurate reference ranges, we use reference ranges that actually indicate health as opposed to the average unhealthy person, you know, we catch way more of these things. So we're looking at that and go say, yeah, you know, it's sort of at the upper limit of you know, your TSH and these things are sort of at the lower limit of your, you know, T3 and T4 or something, whatever. And, and for us, it's just like, those are way out of bounds, right? So there's something going on there. We check their antibodies and what do you know? They have, they have all these Hashimoto's uh, antibodies, you know, and their, their normal doctor would never have checked for that because to them, their thyroid was perfectly normal. So yeah, I think that that is something that's largely under far underdiagnosed, and is something that uh, you know people should be more aware of, aware of. Uh, carnivore diet helps that. You do see people getting better, and we see their thyroid antibodies going down. You know, so it's, there's uh, you know saying that that it's not only that their function is getting better, like they're they're objectively their antibodies are getting less and less and less, and they finally go away. They can take a while. Hashimoto's for some reason takes a long time for those antibodies to clear and people really do need to be strict. I think it's easier to be a bit more loose with it on something like Hashimoto's because it's, it is, it is a bit longer. And you know, if you sort of slip up, there's not like that, that clear bang. Like if you have Crohn's and you slip up and all of a sudden you have, you know, 20 episodes of bloody diarrhea, I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that again. You know? So it's a bit, it's a bit easier for your, your, your body keeps you in check a bit better than that. But uh, when people stay, you know, very strict and just, you know, red meat and water, they do very, very well. The next one is supplements. I hear this a lot. So the one thing that people <laughs> want to hear about is probiotics. They they want to know how does your microbiome recover or get better on a carnival lifestyle, and do they need things like kefir, sauerkraut to add in to a carnival diet to help with their microbiome? Uh, you know, long-term, no, I don't think so. You know, if you're, if you're sort of just getting started or if you just had antibiotics or something like that, you know, having some of these ferments is, you know, uh, you know, might help, you know, seed the, the, uh, the way, but long-term, uh, I don't think you necessarily need to do that. You know, the, in, there, there have been studies looking at the microbiome of, of indigenous populations like the Inuit, uh, who don't really eat ferments, you know, maybe, maybe some of their fishes, fish go bad or something like that. And, you know, they have some, some like rotten fish heads and things like that, which is something that some people do uh, by and large, they're just eating seal meat and, and things like that. And now the, then their microbiome is, is, is beautiful. You know, it's, it's very diverse. It has all these different microbes that are always associated with, you know, better health. And this is like, wow, this is really good microbiome. So, you know, your, your microbiome is, you know, is dictated by what you're eating. And if you're eating what you're supposed to be eating, then you're going to cultivate the microbiome that you are supposed to have. And same with the oral biome. This is why people, you know, that are on carnivore, they don't really get cavities. They don't get tartar. They don't get, uh, you know, like staining and things like that. They have much wider teeth. I've some people said in like in three weeks, they're like, wow, my, my teeth are just already getting wider. I'm like, all right, that's, that's pretty fast. But, um, you know, we do know from the fossil record that people before the agricultural revolution, you know, had big wide jaws, you know, fully formed jaws, wisdom teeth were all erupted and beautifully they're straight, you know, pristine teeth, just like every other animal in the wild, right? You don't see, you know, giraffes and lions with crooked, funky teeth, you know, because that's not genetic. It's, it's nutritional. It's a, a nutritional uh, deficiency that causes that and a developmental uh, issue that causes that. 
Um, and there's other things to do with, you know, eating the right thing and eat soft food and sucking on your thumb and all these different things can affect the way your palate, uh, hard palate and teeth form and, you know, and, and breathing through your nose as opposed to breathing through your mouth, you know, makes a lot of difference. So there are a lot of things, but, you know, crooked teeth and things like that is, is, is largely to do with, with um, malnutrition. So, you know, before the agricultural revolution, people really weren't getting cavities. They weren't losing teeth. They all had straight, nice teeth directly after the, the agricultural revolution, tons of cavities, missing teeth, rotting mouths and crooked teeth, small jaws and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, that has to do with nutrition, but the cavities has to do with your oral biome. You know, they did not have toothpaste back then. They did not have dentists uh, back then. So, you know, you, you uh, as, um, you know, Dr. Kevin Stock said, he's, you know, he's a dentist and he does carnivore as well. He said that, you know, if you just eat carnivore, you just eat what you're supposed to eat. You don't need dentists. Dentists don't, don't need to be a thing. You know, you just sort of, you brush your teeth normally, you know, even, even just, you know, just scraping the stuff off with a bit of, of baking soda and like that, that's it. You, you're not going to need dentists throughout your life unless you have an accident and you'll know, break a tooth or something like that. Um, you know, chewing on something, you know, like a bone or something like that, 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 uh, went the wrong way, but your oral biome is going to be optimized. Your microbiome and your colon is going to be optimized as well. Maybe catching up, uh, with some ferments, um, you know, if you're coming from, you know, a, a weird way of eating before, um, you know, a non, uh, appropriate human diet before, and, uh, or if you've had antibiotics for some reason or another, and you want to sort of restart, you know, I, 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 I've only had to take antibiotics maybe like sort of once or I don't know, maybe twice in the last you know, many, many years, you know, and, and after that, I just, I had some yogurt. I just had like a spoonful of, of live culture yogurt every day for, you know, a, a week or two. And that was it. I mean, I didn't, I don't know if I needed to do that, you know, but, um, but I did. And, uh, and that's what I think. So I, I really don't think that you don't need much of that. You know, if you're not eating that way, you know, ferments can, can help. They can certainly help if you're not eating carnivore, I think. But I think once you're eating carnivore, you're going to cultivate the microbiome that you need. And it's just going to perpetuate. You're just going to perpetuate. You don't need to add more bacteria in. It's already there. And then you're just, you're, you're eating the right things that will promote those, uh, those bacterium. So I don't think it's it's necessary for most people, especially long term. Okay, the the last two is kind of one and the same, which is a lot of people when they start carnivore, they compare themselves to other people. So, for example, somebody might be eating a certain ribeye or a steak, and they think, "Oh, I need to eat the same," or "I'm under eating or overeating." Also, on top of that, they also compare themselves in terms of results. So, somebody has healed their arthritis in three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. Why aren't I? Somebody has lost 50 pounds in a month. Why haven't I? So this idea about comparison as well as expectation, how do you help people handle that on a carnival lifestyle? Yeah, I think that I think that's a very good point. That's something that can discourage people uh, immensely. You know, they 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 go on a carnival because they're seeing people have such great results and they want those results. Um, but you know, people are wired differently. Um, and they and they have different backgrounds. They've been doing different diets. They've been eating different ways. They're, they have different biochemistries. Their metabolisms are very different. Their insulins are very different. They're all, all their their leptin and leptin resistance and all these sorts of things are different. Their hormones are different. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to have the exact same results for everyone, but consistently over time, everyone will get the same results, which is you'll optimize your health and you'll optimize your body composition. Now people are doing this stuff, you know, much later on in their life. They may not be able to get back down to the body they had when they were 16, you know, or the body, you know, the body fat percentage that they had when they were a teenager. However, uh, you are going to, you are going to significantly improve your health and, and your body fat and your muscle and uh, you're going to you know, put on healthy fat or healthy muscle you might put on healthy fat if you're too skinny. You know, it is taught in, in medical school and in, in, you know, I've heard orthopedic surgeons talk about this, where they say you, you can only lay down bone up to the age of 25 and then you just start losing it. And so you have to lay down as much bone as possible because you just start just turning to dust after that. And that's actually not the case. I've seen people in middle and late age who go into a carnivore diet and start, you know, a resistance uh, program. And they're actually reversing osteoporosis and osteopenia uh, in, in very short time. You know, one, one lady, um, you know, had her on my podcast. Um, she uh, had been anorexic vegan and she uh, was borderline osteoporotic. And in one year on a carnivore diet, she had, you know, put on a lot of healthy weight. She was feeling amazing. And 
she started doing resistance training as well. And she got her, her tests and her bone density scan. And, and she had completely, um, you know, gone the other way. So now she was borderline, she was osteopenic, but she was borderline osteo had borderline osteoporosis. She was just on that cusp. Now she's back the other way. So now she's borderline not being osteopenic. So, you know, that, that's a massive, massive improvement in just one year and she's 40, right. Or 39 at the time. And so, you know, that, that's huge. That's an absolutely huge, uh, recovery. So, um, but you know, it takes time, you know, I mean, for her, that took, that took a year, right. And, uh, other people are, are going to find that there's a bit slower as well. So people can focus on that and they can say like, well, I, I want, I need to lose weight. And these people are losing weight fast. So that's what I want. And they'll, you know, and they may not have the same weight loss that other people have. And they can get very discouraged by that. And, um, and, and some people I've spoken to online and they were like, yeah, you know, I, or in comments and things like that. And they'll say like, wow, you know, I love the carnivore diet. I really wish it worked for me because I felt so much better. I, you know, I, it, it, it you know, really helped my autoimmune issues. I came off medications. I lowered my blood pressure medication, you know, sort of stop having diabetes and all these sorts of things. And I had such great energy, felt really good. Uh, but I just wasn't really losing weight. So unfortunately, carnivore diet didn't work for me. And to me, it was like, well, it sounds like it worked amazingly well. <laughs> and um, you had all these these benefits. So, you know, don't get myopic. Don't just focus on one thing, right? Look at the big picture, right? This is about health first and foremost, right? How are you feeling? How is your health? Are you improving your health in objective measures? Are you coming off medication? Is your blood pressure coming down? Is your blood sugar coming down? Is your HbA1c coming down? Are you not having any autoimmune flare-ups anymore? Are you able to come off your medication because your body is doing so well naturally? That's what you need to focus on. What are your energy levels? How are you sleeping? You know, those are the things that matter, right? The weight will happen. You know, it takes longer for some people, but it will happen. And even if it never happens, this is about health. And so you need to focus on your health and how you're feeling and just trust in the process. Just understand that this is, and look into it, look into the data on, on and the evidence on why this is the optimal diet, why this is the best thing that we can eat, you know, because that's really important to understand. And a lot of people as well, when they, when they stall on the weight loss side of things, you ask them like, what exactly are you eating? They're like, oh, just, just meat and water. So nothing else. So no coffee, no sweeteners, no this, no that. Oh, no, I still drink coffee and I have monk fruit sugar and I have dairy. And I was like, okay, well, look, you know, those things, you know, can can cause problems. So the first thing you need to do is you need to get rid of those. You know, you need to get rid of the sweeteners. You need to get rid of the, the dairy. You need to get rid of the heavy cream. You need to get rid of the coffee. Just eat meat and water and see how you go then. But also, even then, you know, they were they were already doing so much better. You know, they had come off all their medications and improved things in so many different ways. And now they're going back to eating another way. They're still not losing weight. Now they're back on the medication. And their blood pressure goes up. And so it's like, okay, probably not the best thing to do. So yeah, so, you know, think big picture, think health, as opposed to just the one thing that you're concerned about. You know, if you have a health issue and you're worried about that one health issue, fine, but you know, is it getting better? Maybe it's maybe it's not going away. I mean, I've, I've I've talked to people that you know are diabetic, type two diabetic, and they're all a battery of different medications and insulin. Well, I shouldn't have to take this anymore. You know, carnivore cures this. I'm just off of this now. So they stop taking their medications, and they're asking me like, "Why is my blood sugar all crazy?" And I was like, "Well, did you did you mess with your medications?" Yeah, oh yeah, I just stopped them. Like, well, don't do that. Oh, you know, you still need to be. It takes time to heal your body. And some people still will need to take a bit of medication. You know, the diet can't fix everything. Sometimes there's, there's such a thing as damage done and there are other causes of different diseases as well. Most of them are from eating the wrong thing, but not everything, you know, so you have to, you have to keep that in mind. And, and so, um, you know, you know, don't, don't just stop medications right away before, before you're ready and things like that. So, you know, it's about health, be realistic, this takes time, you know, as, as one person uh, I spoke to you said, you know, there's no shortcuts. You took it, you know, you walk 10 miles into the woods, you're going to have to walk 10 miles out. All right. You, there's no, there's no shortcuts. Like you, you, you damaged your body for decades. You know, most people unwittingly, most people we've followed exactly what we've been told to eat. We've been eating whole foods, fruits, vegetables, and grains, lean meat, 
and try to you know limit fat and all these sorts of things drinking you know uh skim milk i drank skim milk for 35 years you know and um and uh, maybe even more than that and uh you know and that's because you're doing what you're told to do and and people are getting sick as a result of it people are, oh well people aren't listening people aren't doing what they're told it's like no the problem is they are listening the problem is they are doing what was recommended to them and that is what is getting them sick and they're getting more and more sick as we go so you know just understand this is the healthiest thing that you can do it's the best thing for your body and your body will get better but it takes time and uh and to focus on the gains that you're getting you know if you were saying i have this issue and this isn't moving as fast as i want look at everything else as well what else is going on or other things proving your your sleep and your energy and these other health issues like okay actually there are good things happening so so under you'll recognize all the good things count your blessings it's a very very uh you know um, appropriate thing here is is counting your blessings look at all the benefits this is giving you look at all the ways that this is helping you out and and focus on that and address that and then just just be in it for the long term this isn't just like oh i'm just going to cure my rheumatoid arthritis and i can just go back to eating crap no because it's the crap that is causing the rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have, you can't ever eat that stuff again. I'm sorry, but you know, why would you want to, you know, it's just like, Oh, I got rid you know, I had lead poisoning because I had lead pipes in my house and, you know, I was really sick. I almost died, but then I got rid of it. And so now I'm better. Um, and so when can I go back to drinking lead water? Because it tastes really good. You know, that leaded water is like so good. You what know? a great so when analogy can I go back to doing that. It's like, no, you just, you just, you just don't do that anymore. That's just not something you do. You know, it's just not something you do, you know, and you just never do that again, you know, unless you want lead poisoning again. Right. And so just, you know, understand that this is a long, this is the long game. This is something that is a lifestyle. It's a way of eating, you know, and you're just like, I'm not going to eat crap anymore. I'm not going to eat poison anymore. I'm just going to give myself the best nutrients. I'm going to let my body do its thing. And I'm going to be as healthy as I possibly can be for the rest of my life. And if you do that, you will find that you get very, very good results. And over time, over the years, you will get down to what your body is able to get down to. And you'll be as healthy as your body is able to be. And you won't be any healthier doing anything else. There was one statement that we couldn't shout to the world. That would be it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Chafee. I hope everybody got some value from these 10 things that could be ruining your results and, you know, try to think about it. You know, is it relevant to you? Is there things that you could improve on the carnival lifestyle? But Dr. Chafee, I want to say thank you so much again. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure as well. You might like to watch this video next with Dr. Elizabeth Bride, especially if you're starting a carnival diet to heal and to lose weight. You might need to know how to start a high fat carnival lifestyle the right way. You might also like to watch this video by Dr. Ken Berry discussing the ultimate beginner guide to start the carnivore diet. I'll see you guys next week.